happy to have you this uh, morning for the presentation of the 2019 Philippine Innovation Public Expenditure Review, which will be discussed later by an expert from the World Bank. So to formally begin our activity, may I call on PIDS President Dr. Celia Reyes for her opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. Um, our topic today is very interesting because it talks about the importance of innovation in the growth of the economy. Uh, we're very honored to have with us here uh, Dr. Um, Xavier Sirera, Senior Economist of the World Bank, who will present the 2019 uh, Philippine Innovation Public Expenditure Review. Uh, this is part of the World Bank's um, Public Expenditure Review of Innovation Policy which the bank conducts um, to help countries improve their policy making and budgeting in the areas of science, um, technology, and innovation. Uh, as we all know, innovation is a major driver of economic growth, productivity, and competitiveness. Governments around the world are cognizant of its vital role in achieving sustained economic growth and development. But how does the Philippines fare globally in innovation? Based on the 2018 Global Innovation Index, the Philippines remained at the 73rd spot out of um, 126 countries. Meanwhile, our ASEAN neighbors such as Singapore further moved up to rank five from seven in 2017. Malaysia from, um, to 35 from 37, Thailand to 44 from 51, Vietnam to 45 from uh, to 45 from 47, Brunei to 67 from 71, Indonesia to 85 from 87, and Cambodia to 98 from 101. The Global Innovation Index, which is a composite measure of innovation, is being conducted annually by INSEAD, Cornell University, and the World Intellectual Property Organization. The 2017-2022 Philippine Development Plan attributes this poor performance to the low amount of public expenditures on research and development, inadequate number of research scientists and engineers, not enough science, technology, and innovation infrastructure, coupled with a fragile intellectual property culture, restrictive regulations that hamper the conduct of research, and the weak linkages of firms engaged in innovation activities with government and the academe. While the Philippines has had a slight increase in R&D expenditure to GDP in recent years, from 0.12% in 2005 to 0.14% of GDP in 2013, this level of spending is still way below the 1% of GDP benchmark recommended by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO. It also, fails, it also falls below the spending of several ASEAN member states like Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam. And in the case of the Philippines, the nation of micro, small, and medium enterprises with over 99% of the total number of establishments being MSMEs. In terms of employment, they account for about 63% or nearly 500 million jobs. Given this, um, no, not 50, probably, 50 million um, jobs. Given this, SMEs can be a potent force for economic development if the right policies are in place to increase their competitiveness, which in turn will allow them to latch on to regional production networks that have been a source of tremendous growth for East Asian economies in recent years. It's therefore imp important for government to provide support to SMEs to enable them to become innovative and competitive. In recent years, the government through the Department of Trade and Industry has implemented a number of programs to assist MSMEs such as the Startup Ecosystem Development Program, the QBO Innovation Hub under the Negotiation Center Plus model to assist entrepreneurs and would-be entrepreneurs and the Shared Services Facility Program, Facilities Program to assist MSMEs in acquiring tools and equipment specific to their trade, to name a few. But how effective are these programs and policies in addressing the constraints that firms face? Do these policies help firms build sustainable capacity, capabilities? Do they generate the desired impact? These are some of 
the questions that we hope our resource speaker will answer in his uh, presentation, among many others that I'm sure you, you have. So we, without much ado, uh, may we request Dr. Sirera to um, share um, his thoughts about this uh, topic. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to present a mixture today about uh, the methodology of these public expenditure reviews and uh, the work that we've done in, in the Philippines, which is uh, still not finished. Uh, so I'm going to show you some uh, initial findings of one part and more complete findings uh, of the other one. The f so a couple, of, a couple of things I want to, to, to raise at the beginning. One is the, the name public expenditure review. It may take to confusion because we actually have more than one name for this. We also call it uh, 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 public uh, evaluation. Uh, and depending who the client is, uh, we use one title or the other. For example, if the Ministry of Finance is the client, we use public expenditure review. It's, it's way more attractive to them. But the objective is the same, is to, to improve uh, the quality of, of the policies. And the second, the second issue is that while we have implemented this tool a lot uh, on science, technology, and innovation policies, we lately have uh, broadened the scope to more generally SME support policies. Okay, and the exercise that we've done in in the Philippines is about e SME policies that includes some of the science, technology, and innovation policies. So let me let me start uh, with the motivation. Uh, why are we doing this? Uh, so we've done a lot of impact evaluations at the World Bank. We still believe on evidence-based policies uh, you know, as a central and core element for policy making. And I think there is a huge agenda that we need to push about understanding the, 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 the impact of such policies. But at the same time, uh, the more you go to very strong or very robust uh, uh, impact evaluations, uh, the more time consuming it is and resource consuming, but also we felt that we were not able to say very much about uh, more generic things about processes. So we were in situations where we could say to a government, we have evaluated this uh, a specific instrument about matching grants for exports or, for, uh, or a prototyping um, program. And I'm telling you, we don't find any evidence of impact. And then the government would respond back and say, okay, so what do I do, okay? And what went wrong? And uh, what do I do with the other policies, you know? And we were not unable to, to respond in a convincing way uh, uh, to that, okay? At the same time, we have all these reviews of, uh, of, of sci uh, science, technology, and innovation, all these uh, ecosystems, diagnostics, which are very good, but they are somehow also very aggregated. They, they touch in very important stuff, but we were caught in the middle where we, again, we will not say very much about what are the specific policies that you want us to change and how, how to change that, okay? So the objective and the, the reason why we developed this tool is to be able to you know, support governments in telling them, well, maybe you should think about doing more about this thing or the other thing, okay? And also when doing that, we realized that it was actually a, a very I important tool for planning uh, because Many countries, we were not able to tell us how much do they spend on innovation, how much do they spend to support the medium-sized enterprises, how much support programs for, for exports, okay? So this is a little bit of, a, of, of the motivation of why, why we're doing this exercise. Um, so the objectives are twofold. First one, we want tangible advice uh, on how to improve the composition of this policy mix. I don't know if you're familiar with the term of the policy mix. The set of policy instruments that you use to support innovation or to support the, the private sector, okay? Uh, we wanted to uh, maximize the coherence. Uh, we want to improve the coordination as well, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this, okay? And at the same time, we want to build the capacity in governments in how to improve that. So we're gonna get into something that was new at the time for us that was very much about policy making, about how you design and implement these objectives. One thing I'm telling you now is keep in mind that 
uh, as I said before, we were frustrated with impact evaluations, but there is no substitute for impact evaluations to know impact. So the trick in this methodology is that we're going to say a lot of things the best we can without evidence of impact. So we are always very careful on saying, okay, you, you need to close this program on uh, matching grants for exports when we don't have uh, enough information about, about the impact. So keep in mind uh, during my presentation that we don't have that. We will build into existing impact evaluations when possible, but it's not always the case and we don't always have the resources to do that, but at least we can say something about how to improve the composition of, of these policies. All right, so let me, uh, let me describe the methodology. So the methodology was developed by a colleague of mine, Paolo Correa, at the Bank 2. And it's based on what would be a logical framework uh, uh, at the time was developed for science, technology, and innovation. But you can replace that graph with something equivalent for formalization of firms, for the cycle of exports, and so on. Okay? So what you're going to do as, a, uh, as, as, a, as an agency for support, you're going to have some public spending, in this case, for R&D okay, and innovation. Some are going to go to the enterprise sector. Some can go to public research organizations. With that, you're expecting to get some outputs out of it. That's going to be uh, people trained, uh, companies with prototypes, and uh, whatever it is. And that you're expecting that is going to translate into new products, new processes, new innovation, uh, new science industry collaboration, research excellence, and so on. Of course, with the idea, with the final outcomes of improving productivity, improving the livelihoods of, of people, right? So. The idea was, ca what can we do about that? Can we think about different stages of evaluation where we're going to focus on inputs, outputs, outcomes, and impact? We know that the final, the impact, we know how to do it. Okay, that's an impact evaluation, and that our methodology is well established. You can do an RCT, uh, whatever you can do with the data that you have, and that we can tell in a robust, if the data is available in a robust way, whether you're going to have an impact or not. Okay. So our focus is going to be more on the, other, on the other three steps. So we develop this idea. Uh, I'm going to focus on the first two stages, yeah, because the third one we've done a pilot, but uh, uh, is still a bit uh, underdeveloped, and it's quite complex. I'll tell you a little bit in a minute. Okay? The first one was when we look at inputs, okay, what can we say about the quality and composition of this policy mix? Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to first to map all the instruments available. All right? so, uh, it, sounds, it sounds very obvious, but most governments don't do that exercise. Okay? So uh, from the budget perspective, the budget works in more aggregated uh, uh, projects, okay? uh, aggregated budget lines that include several instruments. So we said, why don't we build first all the portfolio. So don't tell me that your overall strategy is uh, I want to invest uh, so much on innovation. Show me the facts. Show me the instruments, how you do that. So that's what we do in the, in the, in the, in the first phase. Okay? And then we're going to look, and I'll show you in a minute, about how coherent is that with objectives, how many redundancies, uh, how many gaps in the system, and uh, how does it relate to what we find uh, with other evidence that uh, the private sector needs, and so on. Okay? The second part what is what we call uh, the functional and governance analysis. And what we're going to do here, more focusing on, on, on the instruments themselves, is what can we say about the quality of design and implementation. Okay? And this is, for us, was kind of a, a, a new thing. Okay? Because very often uh, people would say, well, we need to increase uh, science industry collaboration. All right, okay, who can qu question that? I mean, of course, we want to do that, all right? And then they would say, so we need to do some sort of collaborative grants, okay? And some t somehow, the discussion almost is finished. So you're gonna say, we identify a problem, science industry collaboration, then we're gonna define that it has to be a, a collaborative grants project, okay? And then, Maybe, maybe we're going to evaluate it if it's having an impact. Maybe. In most cases, it's not evaluated. But what is missing in the middle and that where we had a lot of interest, it was on the quality of design and implementation of this instrument. Okay? And this is 
very often uh, ignore on all the policy discussions. We talk about problems, we talk about potential input, uh, uh, instruments to, to address that problem, but who's gonna design it, how, and who's to implement it? Because if you can have a good idea, but if it's not well designed and implemented, then it's not gonna have an impact, right? So what we did here is we developed a qualitative model of good practices on design and implementation, and what we do is to benchmark some of the instruments in the country to that good practice, okay? And you can uh, say now that, yes, it's going to be very qualitative, yes, we don't have any evidence of impact, but the whole assumption, and it's not an assumption, there starts to be some good empirical evidence, is that good practices in design and implementation are more likely to, to, to translate into more impact, okay? So let me, let me show you now a little bit. So I'm gonna go through the methodology first of, of each of them, and then I'm gonna show you some, some of the results and some of the conclusions that we have for the, for the case of, 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 uh, of the Philippines. So the objective for the f this first part, this portfolio mapping, this quality of the policy mix, is going to be the provide the characterization of the mix, okay? And, and we're gonna evaluate the quality and the coherence. We want to identify gaps, we want to identify uh, redundancies, okay? That says the quality of design implementation, and uh, at the end, we wanna have an action plan on capacity building. Okay, and this is very much, so we expect we're gonna give some recommendations on the first part about how you need to rebalance your policy mix, okay? And we're gonna identify incoherences on your budget allocation. And then we are gonna also advise the government. So these are the areas where you would, uh, you need to invest in getting better processes, uh, uh, better ways of, of, of doing things uh, for design implementation. Um, so, our base, and this is, this is how our public expenditure review is different from other public expenditure reviews, because uh, I'm sure you've seen other uh, public expenditure reviews. The bank does quite a few of those, okay? But the problem is that if you're doing a public expenditure review in education, for example, you're gonna have much more clear uh, inputs, outputs, and outcomes, in the sense you're gonna invest in the schools, then you're gonna have uh, kids graduated, and then you have outcomes in terms of PISA results or other metrics of education. When you go to the private sector development support, this is very different, because you're mixing all sorts of stuff. You're mixing uh, uh, science and technology park, uh, your matching grant, uh, loans, and so on. So it was, it was more tricky, yeah? So the idea here is that we go to what we call instrument ours, uh, as our unit of analysis. The instrument is below what we would call a program. So a program to support productivity is going to have several instruments, okay? And you can think of as an instrument as a budget allocation with a specific objectives and a specific beneficiaries. So you could draw a logical framework, a clear logical framework for that instrument, that then you can aggregate to a project. That project is often what is kind of map to budget, uh, budget items, all right? So we're going a little bit below uh, this uh, program idea. Then in terms of sectors, uh, again, when we've done this in the, in, in the case of uh, uh, science, technology, and innovation, we've basically gone all the way from PhDs and research all the way to innovation. And I haven't mentioned it, but, and I think Bill was here for the, uh, the innovation paradox. So you kind of are familiar already with our view of innovation, which is a very broad view. We want to avoid the R&D view of innovation. It's much broader than that. R&D is an important part. Invention is an important part. But what is more important is the constant upgrading of products and processes. So we're going to anything from managerial practices to other elements that can uh, lead to improvement, improvement in terms of products and processes and innovation, okay? So we're going all the way, okay? In the case of uh, uh, SME policies, we're doing the same exercise in Brazil, for example, and we also include formalization policies, okay? So we have a very broad view uh, the, uh, of, of these uh, support programs, okay? 
institutions, all that they give the support should be included. One thing that we exclude, and it's an important one, is block funding to public research institutions. The reason why we exclude it is because you need a different tool to evaluate, okay? The sort of instruments that we evaluate, especially for the functional part, are very much those that you can establish as almost a call for proposals, a selection of beneficiaries, and we're gonna be an analyzing some of these processes, right? What this tool cannot do is to evaluate these public research institutions that are provided some block funding. That would enter a more traditional PR. We are actually working on this as well. Um, we are developing questionnaires in order to evaluate how uh, uh, commercial orientation, incentives of the researchers, how much uh, they go for competitive allocation of resources, but it's, it's a bit of a different, it's a different uh, area. We need to uh, uh, study this, it's extremely important. In some countries it's critical. If you don't look at this funding going to public research institutions, you are missing uh, uh, part of it. So for example, uh, to give you an example, in the Ukraine we look at this exercise for science, technology and innovation, and it was 86% of the budget allocation was going block funding to national academies, all right? So when we do our part, looking at those instruments that would support the private sector that are not block funding, are competitive, it was peanuts. It was like four instruments, that, that, that's it. No? So I'm not saying that this is not important, it's extremely important, but in this case, this particular methodology is not well equipped to, to, to understand that. So this is the countries where uh, we've done it or, or we are in the process of doing it. So we currently are doing finishing Argentina and Brazil. We already finished in, in Chile and, and, and Colombia. And in Europe we did Ukraine, Croatia, Poland. And in East Asia we have some ongoing Philippines that we're almost finished. Uh, Vietnam is ongoing and Indonesia. And, and we have a few more countries that we can we'll add uh, to the list next year. And our objective as well is to have um, a bit of a, being able to compare the policy mixes across uh, different countries and across developing countries. The OECD has a project on that, more focus on OECD countries, the, but the level of aggregation of this policy mix is a bit more aggregated. We hope that at some point in time we'll be able to compare more uh, the differences in, 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 in the mechanisms of intervention, the objectives, and so on between, between different, different uh, countries. All right. Any questions so far? Please interrupt if, if there is anything is not clear. Yeah. So let me, let me start with the, the first part on the, on the evaluation of, of the quality of, of the policy mix. All right. So what we're going to do first The big industries. What, what do you mean? No. So this is a. So you mean in terms of beneficiaries or in no for beneficiaries everybody, everybody, every every no, everybody support to science, technology, and innovation or pr primarily the business sector. We don't dis make distinctions between size, in f uh, of the firm. So large corporations. Sorry? What do you mean by SMEs? By SMEs? Small and medium enterprises? Yes. So, so by that, so what we do is support to the private sector, okay? Yes. No, no. So, Okay, let me just uh, differentiate between uh, what the general methodology, okay, and what we don't for the Philippines, okay? So the general technology is support to any business, regardless of the size. In the case of the Philippines, because of the work with DTI, the request was to analyze small and medium enterprises. So that's, where, that's the boundary? Yes, that's the boundary. Uh, in the case of the Philippines, I don't think we, I think we have some programs where when we look at the program itself, they did not say that large corporations were excluded. So actually we have some programs that may have supported large corporations. So our now is the SME. Is it still 
Sorry, I don't understand the question. How? Well, I thought you had a boundary. So we have a boundary yes. in the discussion with DTI. Okay. So they told us we want you to look at the SME policies. Yes. yes. When we look at the different instruments included, yes. we ask them if they have a size, a size uh, uh, criteria for selection. Okay. Yes. If they don't, if anyone can apply then large companies are included. But we have a definition for it. I, I know. So I'm confused now. So, so I'm confusing you. All right. I want the boundaries is for your study. No, no. So I'll, I'll say it again. We asked DTI and DOST for, for, for support to the private sector. OK? The framework of this exercise was support to SMEs, SME policies. That's the label that the government uses, correct? Then we ask the managers to tell us in their particular instrument if they would exclude any type of firms or if the selection would apply to only uh, a specific set of firms. In some cases, large companies can apply. Where is the inconsistency? Yes. The, the big corporations to benefit from that program. That's why you have to yes. use the sample. Yes. We will not exclude, we will ask to tell us what the programs are, okay? And then we would ask if they exclude companies. And in some cases, large companies are not excluded. So the impact is good. If the program has some beneficiaries that are large companies, yes. But the policies are for SMEs. Yes. Yes. So, in, I mean, one, one, one conclusion of what I'm going to show you is that we don't think uh, that uh, to do policy based on the size of the firm is a good policy. The policy should be based on the... That's exactly the nature of my question. It's not a good policy. It will depend on, on the size of the firm. Yes. No. So so yes, you but... Have, you appear that you have some inconsistency in the past. Yes. But but I mean, in other countries, we basically use private sector development policies and we include everything. everything. Yeah, all right. Um, so, so we're gonna do a characterization of, of, of the, so, sorry, going back. So we're gonna look at the context, the economic structure of the country, okay? So we need to have some ideas uh, where the problems are. And I'm not gonna present these results, uh, but there is a, a parallel study that is looking at uh, comparing Philippines with other countries in terms of uh, benchmarking from productivity, patents, and other elements. The idea is to have some context and to have a priority list of elements that according to the analysis suggest uh, that uh, the government should be investing money. That shouldn't be only the reason to invest, but the idea is if you're ranking very low, for example, say in uh, uh, process innovation, you should expect there is some attention from the government in order to support uh, 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 firms to do more process innovation. Okay, so we'll do the characterization of the policy mix. Okay, we we'll look, as I said, how how the policy mix will respond to economic structure, and we we'll look at different issues of coherence that I'll, I'll show you, and more importantly, an issue of of redundancies, uh, problems of scale, and so on. Okay, and in the case of the Philippines, the, the, I can tell you now already that the system or the institutional framework is thinner than in many countries. You have other countries where you have a lot of agencies competing for resources, doing uh, the same stuff. So this, is, this issue of, of minimum scale, this issue of uh, redundancy is extremely, extremely critical. I think in the case of the Philippines, the system is much, much thinner. You have fewer agencies, fewer institutions, competing for, for that, okay? 
All right, so here's some uh, guiding questions about how do, we, how do we do that. We have a matrix. We look at the matrix in terms of objectives, so that instrument, what are the general objectives, what are the type of beneficiaries, uh, what sort of firms can apply, okay, what part on the life cycle of firms uh, they are supporting, okay. Then we're going to look at this coherence, okay, how, how um, coherent is with the stated objectives in budget allocation, with the demand uh, observed, okay, and then uh, we're going to look at, at, at consistency across, okay. All right, so let me show you uh, a few numbers, and please don't take this as final because we're still missing some of the, of the, of the instruments, okay. So here you have the distribution of, uh, of uh, annual expenditure by, by agency. So these are the agencies that concentrate uh, uh, most of the budget. On those four, this is around 77% 70, 70, uh, of budget. One thing I haven't mentioned that uh, complicates uh, the analysis a little bit, and I'll, I'll show you in a minute, is um, that it's not only public expenditure here, okay? And the problem what complicates things is loans, okay? All the finance and lending, all right? Because this is not a, so uh, direct transfers in terms of subsidies is the public expenditure, but then of course, you're gonna have the creation of uh, funds for equity for a, a startups or for loans that are gonna be recurrent in a fund that are gonna be lending. So take a lot of these numbers, not only as public expenditure, but uh, take it as, as, as a potential transfer, all right? So when we're talking about direct uh, uh, subsidy, it's a direct subsidy to the transfer, okay? When we're talking about loans, it's gonna be an available loan that of course is reimbursable, you need to repay. So here is a bit convoluted, don't take it only as, as uh, uh, government expenditure, take it as w uh, more as, as uh, transfers to, to different beneficiaries, okay? Um, all right. So here you have uh, 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 differences between uh, uh, DTI and, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the Department of Science and Technology. So we look at, at both, yeah? Uh, here you have the, the share of programs. Again, don't take this as final because we are missing some problems, uh, programs from, from DOST. And part of the issue was related to this understanding of, of SME that we were discussing now in the sense that uh, the understanding was what are the programs to support to SMEs. So they gave us only a few. And then we, and we ask again, then um, we make clear that we wanted support to the private sector, not those that has in the name SMEs, then the list start increasing. And that's the reason why, why we haven't finished. And that links again to this issue of of SME policies uh, uh, per se. Okay. So here you have the concentration. I think this is one finding that we find in many countries. Again, you need to be careful because the, the, the yellow uh, um, bars are loans. This one? So we have that. The one important thing is the budget units that we need, that we use, are based on summing up all the particular instruments. So all the stuff, all the budgetary allocation that goes to agencies just to pay salaries, to pay all the stuff, that's excluded. Okay. So in 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 one way, when you see differences between our numbers and the budget allocations from the top. These are issues that are related to, you need to, I mean, people need premises to work, you need to pay electricity, you need to pay. And there, there are some issues that are interesting from an efficiency point of view. In cases of public research institutions where, uh, you know, the, the production of output in terms of research or commercialization is very small, yeah? But our numbers are all uh, bottom up. So we aggregate it from the transfers, okay? And again, uh, keep in mind these uh, these loans that uh, we use this as, as potential for lending, but they are not budget expenditure per se. They have a component of subsidy, but it's very hard to calculate uh, that subsidy equivalent. All right, but part of the picture, which is something that we're finding in many countries, 
and this is a part of a conversation with the Ministry of Finance, because in some countries we do this exercise from a rationalization point of view, is that then when you go to the numbers first, they are not very large when you look at the transfers, okay? Maybe there are inefficiencies in terms of uh, some of the agencies, but then there is high concentration, okay? In this case, these four, uh, these instruments until there is 80% of the resources. So we can talk about 61 that we have that is gonna increase, I don't know, to 70, okay? But then when you talk about really allocation of resources, you always talk about a few, yeah? And I think uh, we've seen, that, seen this in, in other countries when uh, the kind of the fiscal uh, type of conversation, it actually leads to very few instruments where you can make, you can make a, a difference, all right? Um, in this case, I don't think we have a tax exemptions. Shall we have tax exemptions here? No. In some other countries where we have as well as tax exemptions, so we have these three types. One is the direct support, okay, the subsidy, then we have the loans, and then we have the tax exemptions. You know, in countries like Brazil, the tax exemptions are the main source of uh, subsidy. And there, there is an implicit subsidy because of the foregone, the foregone revenue. All right, so I don't, I don't know if you can, you can see very much here, but what we do here is also to look at the allocation of, uh, of, of, of resources by type of instrument, no? scholarships, loan and credit, uh, 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 you know, extension services, uh, uh, grants and matching grants, and so on. In the, in the picture for Philippines is more even, okay, than in other countries, where, for example, in other countries we found that uh, a lot of the support is done through matching grants, okay? Or in the case of Brazil, what we find is that when you look really, and here you have differences between the number of instruments and the budget available or the resources available. And in the case of Brazil, for example, what you have is a huge concentration in tax incentives and loans, okay? Why is this important? is, and I know that we're talking about the aggregate, the general, but the important thing is that the type of failure that you find is gonna dictate the type of mechanism of intervention. So in the cases where you have high concentration, there is a mismatch between the problem that you want to address, okay, and the type, the way you are trying to address it. So think about, and, and it's a complex thing, because think about um, R&D, okay? So you want to, to you want to basically uh, support firms in doing more R&D. You have to understand what the source of the problem, and the source of the problem can be different, all right? So the one, the more traditional, uh, that you probably are aware, is the one of externalities. So companies underinvest on R&D activities because they think that if they invest, uh, people in the sector are gonna copy, and they're not gonna be able to internalize the benefits of their own investments. How do you address that? You need to subsidize that. The idea is to give them an incentive, and that's where tax incentives come, right? You can have a situation where the company is not doing R&D because they cannot finance the full R&D project. Why not? Because they go to the bank, and the bank, there is a guy there looks at the project, doesn't understand, doesn't understand the availability, uh, if it's gonna be successful, it doesn't give a loan. It's a financial market imperfection. All right, and then the question is, is a question of risk, is a credit guarantee, or is a, a, a liquidity, is a loan. Or there can be a situation where the company doesn't know how to successfully implement a, 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 an R&D project. And then we're talking about some technical assistance, some grant to support technical assistance. So my point is that ideally, you should be able to identify the problem and then the mechanism of intervention. Okay, in this case, the picture is broad. Uh, we don't have many things to, to say, but the, 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 the message is a little bit to the government and to the managers, think what is the real problem that you want to address, so you design the mechanism of intervention. And don't give grants because that's the only thing you want to do, or don't give loans because that's the way how you're structuring your policies. Have to map it to the, to the, um, to the problem that you want to address. So, um, so we have it as uh, for both, percentage of funds and percentage of instruments, okay? Yes, so if... No, 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 sorry, it's executed. 
yeah, 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 yeah. Everything is executed. The only thing is that for simplification, you can have an instrument where you have uh, uh, more than one mechanism of intervention, one, more than one objective. For simplification, when we look at values, we split the values. So if you have two mechanisms of intervention, you give a grant and a scholarship, we would divide 50-50. So this is an approximation, all right? This is an approximation. For everything that I'm showing you, when there is percentage of funds, there's going to be an approximation, okay? Again, I insist, in some countries we found, for example, huge dependency on matching grants, in others on tax incentives, on, um, on loans, and I hear the message is very much about map your problem to the mechanism of intervention. So this is the focus on SMEs that we were uh, talking about. Okay, I think I, I, um, I took out some of the, of the titles, but in the case of, so we look for uh, uh, life cycle, we look at uh, startups, we look at uh, scaling up for innovation as well, what cycle of the innovation and by size. In the case of DTI, I think was the one, if I remember correctly, where it was primarily about SMEs. That was more uh, strict. You know, we were su uh, supporting SMEs as criteria. And I think this again is the inconsistency about uh, rather than supporting SMEs per se, support the specific objectives of productivity, of exports, and so on, and then th think about who needs the support. So we've done some redundancy analysis as well. The idea here is to cluster programs because we're going to have a list of all the instruments and then we're going to have by objectives, okay? And we're going to try to find those that have the same objectives, type of beneficiaries and so on. And ideally, they are in different, in different agencies. Again, in the case of the Philippines, we found these uh, six clusters, but when you look at the clusters, there are not that many redundancies. In fact, what there is sometimes is more a need to align uh, instruments from DTI and DOST along a specific objective. So the issue of redundancy is, is not so strong in the case of the Philippines. Uh, the number of instruments is, co is low. I mean, in Brazil, of course, it's a huge country, but we have more than 200, okay? In other countries, we are in the numbers of 150, 175, with six, seven, eight agencies, and there is where these redundancies become more obvious. There is where you see like two different agencies doing same programs, incubators and accelerators, for example, or uh, programs for, for the startups in general. And then the question, of course, every agency is going to defend what they're doing. No, we are supporting this sector. No, we are supporting the other one. But the question from policy is really you need to separate it. You need to split management that can uh, bring uh, uh, very high I inefficiencies. All right. Uh, so let me give you some conclusions that we have uh, in terms of this uh, um, first part of the analysis. Uh, I think the, one of the issues, so when you look at the level of expenditure, it's very low, okay? So clearly there is here an issue of, of a scale. I mean, how many firms you are reaching out, how many, what is the potential impact? I mean, I think... Uh, there is an issue where you can state the overall goals of policy about increasing productivity or all the SME uh, plan, but then the issue as well is what are you really achieving with the resources? And clearly there is an insufficiency, all right? But I think the important thing for us is that we need to break this focus on quantity and on SMEs and go more to the specifics. I think we need to be, be more, more uh, refined on anchoring these policies in a specific elements. You want to increase exports, you want to increase innovation, you want to increase startups, all right? And focus more on that rather than SMEs, okay? Um, the way how a structure we are proposing in other countries is that you create the sort of more uh, uh, objectives that go across. So we want more entrepreneurship and formalization, right? So let's meet and see what are the instruments that are available, okay? We want to have more uh, uh, innovation, okay? Let's see what the, the instruments are and whether we are covering all the cycles of innovation. Is there anyone supporting prototyping? No. 
Is there two, uh, two agencies doing more or less the same? This is not so much, as I said, this overlap is not so much of a problem in the Philippines for what we saw, okay? But it's important to continue working in this coordination uh, uh, mechanism. The same for firma grading and technology adoption. One element specific for innovation, okay, is that we saw some bias to the science and technology. So the science, technology, and innovation, uh, clearly from the perspective of, of the Department of Science and Technology, we sometimes very science and technology based. And part is the division of labor between uh, DOST and DTI, but part is also a view of innovation that is still very linear from the R&D perspective. One thing that, for example, um, one example of this was uh, these uh, instruments to uh, support the commercialization of technology, but it was not the commercialization of technology per se, was the commercialization of the technology that was being generated by the public research institutions, okay? And I think the problem on with doing that is that you're pushing one type of technology that you don't know if it's the best technology in the market, the cheaper, and the one that is gonna lead to more productivity. And I think there has to be a bit of a change on that and seeing this technology transfer intermediaries a little bit more as intermediaries and less supply driven. So you want, it, it's critical, and when we talk about all industry 4.0, new industrial revolution, these sort of intermediaries are critical, but are critical to be able to digest existing technologies and bring them to uh, SMEs. Right? If it's a local technology, perfect, but if it's not, it's al also good. You want to bring the good technologies, okay? And, and very often it's gonna be, most of the cases, you're not gonna be able to compete with the Chinese technology or to the German technology. And it's okay. But what you want is to help SMEs say, hey, this is a good technology, it would improve your productivity, and we can support you in adapting it, in, in implementing it, okay? So, um, also, there was issues about uh, creating uh, or more use of market creating instruments, so more credit guarantees, okay, with the risk of innovation working with the commercial banks, okay? Sometimes with the problem with, with this finance for SMEs and finance for innovations is that there is very little work with the commercial banking in order to take on, in the future, this lending themselves. It's, it's almost like, we are replacing the private sector because there is a gap in the market. And credit guarantees are more friendly, are more market oriented, okay? And also they address more directly the issue of risk. And also about supplier development programs. You know, we know from evidence that is coming, especially in European countries, when you try to combine uh, support to SMEs with the potential link to markets, to other companies, it's more likely that you're gonna succeed. It's more likely that the firm is encouraged to do more and better uh, upgrading, okay? And there are some incoherencies in the resource allocation. I, I mentioned about the innovation. There is one inconsistency in export promotion in the sense that there is very few resources going to export. And this is, a, this is a, an important objective that is stated and uh, something that it's imp almost impossible to disagree. But when you look at the budget allocation, there is very, there's very little on that. And the early stage instruments are a bit underdeveloped as well, okay? So, so there is a need to, to address these um, inconsistencies, okay? So let me go to the, to the second part now on the functional analysis, okay? Uh, in here, we basically, as I said, we're trying to measure the quality of design and implementation, okay? I think one important issue that we've been trying to, uh, to raise is that there is a, a very naive view of policy making as something which is almost automatic. If you really find the real problem and you think about the good solution, things will work. And it ignores the realities of the policy making where you need to change incentives. And especially in the private sector, this is very complex, it's highly complex. Because again and again, we've seen where Policy makers are trying to reach out to companies and they're telling them, you need to improve uh, your processes and they're gonna tell you, you're not telling me what I should be doing, okay? I know, I'm in business, all right? So this is a complex exercise. 
a complex exercise, of course, because the policymaker doesn't know what the, the company needs, but even is unable to make the case that some upgrading may be needed, that some improvement uh, may be needed. Okay, so all this view, no, it's fine, you know, you just think about the instrument and start doing matching grants or start doing this, and things will work out, is, is very naive. No? We know as well of some new evidence saying that the managerial practices matter. So we knew it from the, for the private sector. Now there is some evidence for implementation of public policy where they kind of calculate, they look, they measure management, and they see more impact on projects that are better, are better uh, uh, managed. Okay, and I th we think it's also important to find a logical framework, uh, a logical model of the intervention, because there is some inconsistencies that sometimes you find looking at instruments and specifics. Uh, for example, I, I give you an example: one that we that we uh, one program that we saw last week here in the region, where uh, the impact was uh, so the the. The idea that would provide some uh, technology transfer to companies, and the objective was to have a 6.5% of productivity gain in the sector. All right, very specific: 6.5% productivity sector, and they were supporting around 20 firms. Right, so there is a huge gap between the inputs and the outputs that you generate and your out expected outcome. Something that is it doesn't make any sense. All right. What was the problem is there was no logical framework. Because if you write it down, I'm going to spend so much, I'm gonna create, uh, train 20 companies for doing technology, and then I'm gonna go 6.5% uh, increase in productivity in a sector that has 3,000 firms, you're gonna see that it's a huge gap. That doesn't make any sense. No? And I think this is an issue that we are pushing again, and it's an important conclusion for the Philippines that we need to start really uh, developing and drafting these this, uh, logical models of intervention. Okay? And the last one is the financial and human resources, that we, all, we never talk about this. And then when you go and ask people, do you do follow-ups on beneficiaries? No, but I don't have any resources to travel, or I don't have a database or a, an information system to do that. Okay? Or we don't have enough staff to manage. And I think this is an important issue that we need to, to discuss because without the adequate uh, financial and human resources, there is no good design and implementation. The resources are, are, are not there, okay? So, um, so what do we do? What did we do is to develop this model of good practices. We develop the process of design, implementation, and governance. Governance, you can understand it as coordination with these 31 dimensions, okay? Sure, you can think about other dimensions that may be important. This is a bit qualitative, it is. But we think, all in all, it kind of summarizes uh, most of the things that we want to capture. No? So we start with things like origin, all right? And again, so this is a classic example of a minister that goes and travels to Korea, and when comes back, says, I want to do a science and technology park instrument. So that's a bad, that's bad policy. That's bad policy. It, the origin is to be based in something tangible. There is a problem, all right? It's not only to identify the problem, you justify that there is a problem, no? Because very often, again, there is a technology problem in this sector, therefore, uh, we do our own technology and we pass it on. No, that's a bad justification because the Chinese technology is better in this case and you have a problem in customs, or you have a problem of finance for this uh, adoption of technology. Then you go to issues of what are the objectives. You would be surprised how often uh, project managers are unable to tell you the clear objectives of the program. We want to support productivity, all right, but okay, how? And, and what kind of sub-objectives do you have? Something is tangible, measurable, do you measure them, and so on. So we have a list, I'm not going to go through the uh, 31 of them, okay, that try to measure this use of good practices. Okay? At the end, in terms of the governance coordination, we're going to be asking questions about what's the relationship of that particular instrument with other instruments. So you a startups program, do you know that there is another startup program? Do you talk to them? And very often, they are not able to talk to them. Okay? They don't really know. And there is, we don't create the opportunities to, uh, to basically uh, have people to talk and to learn from each other, okay? Issues about um, 
relationship with other institutions. No, we in, in here, we don't talk to the other guys, only the director talks, okay? This is not coordination, that guys go to a, a joint meeting. Coordination is some communication and some channels of communication. And then at the very end as well, we talk about the constraints to uh, impact. Because surprisingly, one, the managers, they know actually why things don't work out very often, okay? And two, sometimes it's surprising the reasons that they give you because they are very binding. All right, so give me a, an example. This is a program of rural entrepreneurship where it's not in the Philippines, okay, it's another country, where basically they want to support farmers with new technologies, all right? And what happens is that the uh, regulations for public support don't allow the government to provide equipment. So what are we talking here? I mean, why did you design it that way when you have such a binding constraint? No, it, was, it wasn't me but it's super hard to implement the program because the rules are against us. So you can see already some of these inconsistencies coming from a, a much more uh, descriptive description of, of the program, okay? So what we do here is we go through all of them with semi-structured interviews and we evaluate them with the best practice, okay? The best practice on the origin is the clear and stated of origin that is based on a, a previous program uh, evaluation on, a, on, a, on some discussions on that is not something ad hoc. And you go on and you can uh, um, um, kind of score each of these if dimensions. All right, so let me show you some of the, um, of the results. So the scale for this is one. One is super poor practice. Okay, it's really badly done. Five is the, is the good practice is implemented, all right? This is the averages across agencies and across dimensions by design, implementation, uh, and governance, and the aggregate. You can see already that the, the design is the poorer part, okay? Implementation is, is a bit better, and governance or coordination is very, uh, is more uh, volatile, it's, there's more variation, more variance, all right? On average, we are in a scale of three, which is not bad, but it's not good, so there's a lot of room for uh, improvement. And it's below what we found in, in Latin American countries, okay? So there is some, some room for improvement. Here, what you have is the average uh, by dimension. So despite the diagram, I know that you cannot read properly the, the titles, but it's trying to put uh, a score for each of the dimensions, right? So the stuff that goes in, all right, that's, there is a gap. So in this case, the logical framework, clearly there are very few or no, I think we found one or two programs that had a logical framework or something uh, 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 similar to a, a logical framework. Um, then we have issues of, uh, of um, evaluation, lack of uh, monitoring evaluation. We have issues of the instrument. One thing that we ask them is when you want to do a program, we would like, and it's good practice to say, I want to achieve science and industry collaboration. I'm going to do it this way because this is the international experience, okay? But also because if I do it looking at a different alternative, it's not going to be so impactful. So we want to see some thought into considering the mechanism of intervention. Not only we do matching grants here or we do loans here, so then we did the loan, okay? And I think that starts as well in uh, the process of design. Okay, a reflection, okay, it's hard to do, okay, but it needs to be a process where you consider other alternatives, you bring some cost-benefit analysis if you can, or at least, at the least, some uh, uh, international uh, experience. Of course, the international experience is not, is not good enough, as the Science and Technology Park instrument has shown again and again and again of being implemented and no one going to the zones, no? but at least to have some, some looking at different, at different alternatives, okay? So with that, that uh, 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 scoring going uh, in, we can identify some of the areas where the, some capacity building could be done. A lot of these things are about processes. It's about the agencies bringing new processes. A lot of the stuff on implementation it also relates to information systems, right? Uh, stuff about infrastructure. Some of the stuff about incentives for the staff, you know, uh, staff should be evaluated according to their performance 
on the program and not about some generic performance. Some of these issues are uh, part of the civil service, are very difficult to uh, influence. We know that, but it needs to be raised that if you really want to use good practices, you need to improve some of these of this elements, okay? So this is, this is the average, okay? So in here would be in a three in terms of origin. So it wasn't that totally ad hoc, but there was not a real clear origin on average, okay? So if you look at the justification, that's very, it's much poorer, it's almost going to a two. Very rarely there is a good economic justification of why do we do an instrument, all right? So you would like to say, okay, there is a science and industry. So don't tell me there is a problem of a science and industry collaboration. I know that, but show me the numbers. Show me that you have done some analysis, okay? Why, where is the problem? Uh, what sectors may not have that problem? What sectors, there is more potential for that collaboration, but the collaboration isn't happening. You need a solid diagnostic. And a lot of these things should be codified in terms of the processes. So whenever some new instrument has to come, you want that everybody fills out the same template and there is a discussion of different agencies, if possible, about uh, having these instruments. Again, in the case of the Philippines, we didn't observe, the, the system is much thinner, we didn't uh, observe so many overlaps, okay? In other countries, this is quite critical because when you do a process of design that is completely individual to the agency, it's very hard to avoid these uh, uh, overlaps because the agency starts doing that and then one year down the line, the other agency say, why are you guys doing this? Uh, we are already doing it. No? All right. So beneficiaries is, okay, so who do you want to support? You want to do industry and science uh, collaboration, right? Who are your beneficiaries, right? Beneficiaries is anyone that works, uh, you know, in any university department, okay, or any sector or industry association. Well, in here you already, it shouldn't be like that. It should be that you are a bit more targeting those with the potential. Okay, so in here beneficiaries is to what extent the selection of the beneficiaries and the group that you identify, yeah, is consistent with the objectives of the program. So to have an R&D, to have anyone can apply for beneficiaries for an R&D program, that's fine, but we all know that not all companies can do R&D. So to what extent you're starting to be more selective and more targeting, okay, beneficiaries. The stakeholders, is that very often what it happens is when you design the instrument, you don't bring any of the stakeholders to the discussion and to the design. Uh, extreme case is we, we do design of public, uh, support to the private sector without the, public sec uh, without the private sector. We didn't ask them, we didn't consult them. They need that, we develop, we design it, and then maybe we discuss with them ex post. You need to consider all the stakeholders. There is a problem in one sector. Well, talk to the guys in the sector, but not only to those guys in the sector, talk to other uh, uh, stakeholders that could be as well uh, part of the problem okay, or part of the solution, right? So there is not enough technical assistance. Did you talk to consult the consultancy companies, to knowledge providers about this technical assistance? So is the consideration, so on the case of beneficiaries, the consideration of the beneficiaries that you can really have an impact on the case of stakeholders is the consideration in the design of the stakeholders that may be involved in the problem or in the solution, yeah? And very often uh, that's not the case, all right? So there is no consideration. So, so, um, so in terms of, so we have m and &E, so, the order would be uh, process monitoring. So you do some sort of process monitoring. This is my, most, these days, most countries, most instruments, they do some sort of process monitoring. What do they uh, monitor, okay? Very often, only some outputs, okay? So we want them to monitor a little bit more than that. Then to have a formal m &E framework with indicators, 
okay? And then to have something on impact evaluation, all right? So even if there is no, if there is a, a, a decision not to do an impact evaluation, that there is a clear rationale not to do it. So as I said at the beginning, you're not gonna evaluate everything, but we want to see that they thought about an impact evaluation if necessary, and if not, they justify. So that would be these three levels if you want, okay? Any more questions? No? All right, so in here, this is for one of the agencies, uh, but the, the, the nice thing is the blue lines, okay, in, in sight, which try to measure for each of the dimensions within that agency, okay, what's the difference between the best performer and the worst performer? So those that the, the numbers are larger, that are coming to, to the exterior, are uh, uh, dimensions where someone from the good program could teach the other guys to do it better. And this was a surprising exercise when we started with this, all right? Because it's not the World Bank that is gonna tell them how to do things better or some external specialist. In some cases, the knowledge is inside. It's inside the organization. And then the question is, why is this guy have managed to develop a good logical framework and the other guys are not doing it, okay? So there has to be an internal decision to learn, to disseminate. And of course, when you look across agencies, that is in many countries with many agencies, you always have some agencies and some particular instruments that they do things properly, they do things well. And then the question is, how can we uh, disseminate these good practices uh, uh, with other instruments. So there are opportunities for learning that are within the agency and across the agencies in the country. Not necessarily has to be an external specialist to tell them how to, to improve things, okay? And these are the cases where we identify some good performers there that could uh, help disseminate these practices. Yeah. Uh, one thing that we did in, in here in the Philippines that is different to what we've done in other countries is we realized soon after we started that when we talk about implementation, implementation is extremely decentralized, right? So what happened is that we would ask all these questions about design, and then when we got to implementation, the responses were a bit vague sometimes. No, this is done this way, this is done the other way. So then we realized that, I mean, in other countries they, have, they keep more control on that, they are more centralized perhaps, so what we did is we complemented the, the, the analysis going to uh, uh, three regions, okay, one, uh, Metro Manila, I think Cebu, and what's the other one? And we ask, we implemented the same tool, this time less uh, instrument-centric and more about how they did it, and we compare, okay? So this is the comparison, it's not that bad. We found some, some issues that needs to be improved. There was a lot of complaints related to the lack of involvement of the design, in the design from, from, from the regions, and also some, in some cases, the transfer of knowledge. Because it's very hard, because if you codify what the design of the, pro of the, of the program is, and then you just send it in a document, uh, you know, you're gonna find in the regions different capabilities to implement, no? So there was some, some issues. In general, it wasn't that bad, Okay, so we, ha we have and um, we find some, some issues that, that needed uh, improvement, no? So more involvement in the, during the design stage, also of the private sector. And this is, I'm, I'm very aware of this, is, this is not an easy task, okay? Because you cannot really like involve everybody in a consultative process for everything because it's very costly. But you do need to be a bit more uh, strategic in to do some focus groups in some regions to talk to uh, uh, different managers, all right? In general, we, we found a good communication channel uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with the directors, the regional directors, okay? Uh, there were some complaints about training and recruitment. I guess this is, you know, it's, it's difficult to avoid, but it's something that to, to keep an eye. Uh, the lack of a clear logical framework and m and &E framework, that the idea would be that it should be done at the central level, but then transfer not only in terms of the framework, this is the framework, this is how we do it, and there is someone or, or a unit that keeps track all of these and, uh, and all the measurements, all right? 
and then these opportunities to exchange. And I know that it's costly, it's costly, but the communication cannot happen only from the regional directors. You have to create opportunities once a year, uh, once every two years, to discussion. And I think it was the negotiation centers where the, that was happening, and they found it very useful. But you need to find these opportunities for the different uh, regional staff that are working in these programs to discuss. Okay. So let me go finishing um, in terms of this functional analysis, the quality of design implementation. What we found is that there is room for improvement. Okay, it's half of the, the frontier of the good practices, but also below from, from, from Latin America. I think this is something that uh, we are expecting it before the start. Okay. Uh, the average score, we found it, I haven't mentioned it, but similar uh, uh, between DOST and DTI. There is no large di differences on that. Again, this more targeted approach to, to MSMEs, more on the quality of companies, less on the size. Okay, it's, it comes from the first part, but also we saw it here in, in terms of the targeting. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on execution. It's something to, and I mean, as being part of of an international organization that we have also some of this pressure on execute. It's something to, to, to consider because uh, there was, uh, it was raised several times a lot of pressure with delays on the, on the budget allocation and then pressures on the execution. And we know that this is the realities of policy making, but it, it leads to, to, to bad decisions and pressure to, to implement when uh, things may not be ready to do it. Uh, the issue of decentralization, okay, more on the design and bringing the private sector from the regions to, to the design. And finally, this need to create in, uh, coordination mechanisms. More about the discussion, creating events where all the uh, managers have the opportunity to learn uh, from each other and to think of well about this DTI, DOST. Again, as I said, because the system is, thi is thin, you primarily have the two departments, uh, it's easier but uh, still there is missing more cross-cutting uh, alignment and coordination with DTI and, and DOST. All right, so thank you. Um. Thank you so much, sir. May we request you to please seat? Okay, so we now uh, proceed to the open forum. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for your sound uh, presentation and very helpful. And uh, after the review, may I ask question on policy? And because it is a question of policy, and for room for improvement, as you have mentioned. Uh, may I ask uh, President uh, Celia <laughs> Reyes to react? How shall, given this uh, review, how shall we improve now our index, our competitive, competitive index? And uh, secondly, I see here an expert on the Industrial uh, Revolution. How shall we make use of this data to further improve our objectives as far as the industrial revolution. May I address this, Dr. Albert, please? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for, for that. Um, we're, we're looking at this, as um, Dr. Sirera mentioned, this is still, um, the report is, is to be finalized. Uh, they're still getting additional inputs. But the way that we would want to use this is that um, they're actually identifying um, areas where policies and programs could still be improved. And so that's how we would use this. Um, in addition, um, I'd also like to mention that PIDS is also doing um, some evaluation of, of some of the policies, not, not just for SMA, SMA. MSMEs, but some of the innovation policies. So DOST is actually uh, partnering with us to evaluate some of the programs. In fact, we met with TAPI, one of the, the bureaus of, of DOST. So I, I think um, there's a lot of um, there's scope for improving, for instance, the design. I think that's one of the things uh, 
that I noted from the presentation, uh, the design of, of policies. And this is also true when we visited um, for the Bohol Forum, we visited the Fab Lab and some of the other uh, programs there. And that's actually one of the, um, the comments as well that uh, some of the regional stakeholders are not um, um, probably um, involved in some of, of the design. Regional partners in, in terms of both um, regional agencies as well as the private sector. So in that forum in, in Bohol, um, we were able to get some, some recommendations in terms of, for instance, I think one of the things that was suggested to us was the, uh, the fab labs. Um, these are the um, facilities being offered by um, the OST, right? Partnership with SUCs. And the comment of Siliman University, which is a private university, was how come um, private universities could not be part of, of that kind of, of program. So we're looking forward to, to the full report um, because they have identified areas where um, things could be improved in terms of coordination, in terms of design, in terms of, of implementation. Um, specifically also in terms of the disparities, the variation, um, uh, performances uh, across regions. And, and I think um, this disparities is also um, reflected in not just in the indicators presented here, but in all the other indicators that we've been looking at. So perhaps Dr. Albert uh, would also want to, to add. I, I don't know why I was called the expert when uh, there were four of us here and all of us are. <laughs> but maybe I was the face of the, of the presentation on the fourth industrial revolution. But there are four of us actually here <laughs> who were part of the scoping study. Uh, I think one of the things that we were, although I'm, my apologies, I, was, I came in late because I had another interview outside. But um, as I was just listening earlier, I was a little bit, uh, I, I just noticed a couple of things, among, um, among other things that, you know, we're, we're really spending very little for, for scholarships. <laughs> uh, human capital investments seem to be not part of I, I, I remember the, the work of uh, uh, Dr. Serrera who, with, uh, where they, they sort of suggested that even if we're going to start thinking of just spending much more <laughs> uh, on, uh, on science and technology and R&D and innovation, uh, there are complementary factors that are not yet there. Uh, human resources in particular, we, we've been sort of saying this over and over that uh, I, in fact, I just a few weeks ago, I just came from Germany also where I was, I was really comparing why is it that other countries have, are really on the frontiers and others are really left behind. Part of it is we have very, very few scientists and engineers and there's no effort yet, systematic effort to increase. Well, there is supposedly, but it's, it's not enough. Eh? Um, and we seem to be, we seem to be always trailing behind because Somehow, media is also uh, what um, trying to show that there are certain careers that are much better better to be a lawyer than a scientist. You know, I mean, think about it. We have twice more lawyers than there are uh, researchers and scientists and engineers in this country. So that's part of the the problem. But and, and the other thing there that we we sort of are picking up, uh, although indeed as Dr. Reyes was saying that. We'd like to see in more detail the, the, the report, the final report. But we're starting to see that sometimes we tend to, maybe our, we're, we're not really systems oriented. We're like, we're doing too many things. We're trying to show that we're doing too many things with little budgets. And in the end, we're not, we're not even thinking well enough uh, whether the problems that, the, the solutions we're giving are actually the, are, are matching the problems that, that, that we face. And uh, so it's, it's going to be important much more for us to start having more discussions. Uh, you know, the, the, the fact that coordination systems supposedly are there, their mechanisms, but I'm not too sure to what extent. We just keep meeting, but then all, all, very often we have all these plans. We have had so many plans, but the, the actual form, you know, translation of the plans to to programs and 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 and, uh, and policies uh, 
there's there's a very wide gap and I think there's a need much more for us to start having uh, discussions among ourselves to, to improve uh, and really have outcomes in mind rather than just thinking along the lines of inputs and, and accomplishments at the end of each year. Okay, uh, thank you Dr. Albert and Dr. Reyes, but before we proceed, may I request our audience to please state uh, their names and affiliations before asking the question. So Dr. Orbeta? The other face of fire. Uh, I, 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 I was struck by the results that there, there's a very poor performance in terms of formulating logical frameworks. So two questions is uh, whether it uh, have you gone around so many countries. Is this true in other countries? And what could be the reason why people don't do that? Dr. Cicera? So, Yes, it's true in other countries. It's not a, still a very common practice. It varies a little bit about the understanding of a logical framework. In some, in some countries, there is not even understanding what a, a logical framework is. In some other countries, they have some vague logical framework where they think about inputs and outputs very loosely, but then it's not translated in anything tangible in terms of a monitor and evaluation framework. So it is, it, is an, it is a norm not to have it, but I think uh, what we're trying to push is that it's implementing everywhere. And the reason is, again, to avoid this sort of uh, uh, mismatch of expectations about what uh, the program is going to achieve, okay? And also allow a bit more reality and grounded of the, of the program itself. Of course, in addition to, to the monitoring and evaluation. Okay, do Dr. Um Pakeyo, would you like to, add to, to ask another question? Yeah, I, on, on, on the question of babes, uh, just on that too. Um, one possibility that, uh, well, what needs to to, to happen also, or part maybe of the explanation, um, is that we, 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 let me put it differently, positively. Maybe we need uh, to develop this logical framework, but that would require also some substantive knowledge of the relationship between, let's say, the instrument and the outcomes. And, and, and understanding the mechanism. And I think my reading of the situation is that uh, many uh, who are involved are not, uh, does not have a broad enough view and a deep enough view of what the underlying process is in terms of what work and what doesn't work in terms of instrumentation and the outcomes. Uh, now, that of course is related to uh, the human development part that, that uh, my friend uh, Toots was uh, mentioning. Now, my, my, but my, my question really is the sort of looking ahead, you, you have just started this very, very useful uh, and, and interesting exercise. Um, do you have any suggestions, particularly a self-interested question like, what can, how can we move forward and what can PIDS do, maybe in collaboration uh, with DTI, DOST, and, and the World Bank, in order to move this forward? Because as you mentioned, this is just really the beginning. And, and, and what are some of the impediments that you have in, encountered which we need to kind of pay attention to? Yeah. So, I mean, ide ideally, you would like to have uh, um, some sort of unit with, uh, within the departments that are able to support uh, the managers in some of this task of monitoring evaluation, of understanding what works and what doesn't. 
So th this is a hard one because basically uh, the departments are constraining their ability to hire, okay? And some of the skills that you may need, they may not be able to hire. So here m maybe PITs can play a, a role on, on this because it's more a specialized type of uh, knowledge is about um, kind of learning from other experiences, uh, being able to transmit some of the knowledge to the to the managers because the average manager is going to have a limited knowledge of all of this that you're saying. In some countries, we've seen a development of these uh, implementation units of m and &E units that play some of this role. It could be that ca that can be done externally. The if done externally, it may work nicely for some of the monitoring, evaluation, and evaluation. But the still, you need to make sure that the kind of the learning uh, from the outside, it fits into the different departments. And that's a hard to achieve from the outside, okay? But I think there is a whole agenda on how to support all these processes, okay? And how to evaluate, monitor, and, and provide the knowledge, okay? One thing that we, I haven't mentioned, but it's one of the dimensions, is that we would like to see in each of the instruments, I mean, su sunset closes, I mean, this is finishing midterm evaluations, okay? But then the question uh, is, who's going to do this, no? And you're gonna have a decision making which, uh, within the departments, ideally we join people from other uh, parts, okay? But someone has to, feed, ha has to feed the information necessary. And again, there may be some role of, uh, of PITS in doing that and, and improving uh, policy. I haven't mentioned the staff of foresight, which is a, another important uh, um, attribute for agencies, which is more sophisticated, which it can be important in the issues of uh, technology, but that again requires quite a lot of capacity in order to do it and it, in order to do it effectively, okay? So this is an early stage of the conversation. We need to talk to DTI and DOST about the results and about the way forward. But indeed, I think the main issue is that this is not to say, well, you adopt m and &E, you adopt learning. I mean, it needs to, there has to be some investment and some governance in order to do that. And I think PITS could play a, a role on, in, in, into this. Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, yes, sir. Uh, Willy Padolina from the National Academy of Science and Technology. I trust that DOST and DTI mentioned to you that there are other money pots in R&D, the Department of Agriculture and the, and the Commission on Higher educa Education and the state universities and colleges. They have their own money pots for R&D. So I'm afraid that if you will start evaluating the impact and also the redundancies, you might miss these investments from the other agencies. Uh, DOST has a Philippine Council for Agriculture and Aquatic Resources uh, Management, Research and Development. The Department of Agriculture has a Bureau of Agricultural Research. So I don't know how you will assess the universe of the investments that are being done when you start looking at impact because, and also redundancies, because I don't think you, have, you I trust that they've mentioned it to you, but I don't know if you have looked at these portfolios in the Department of Agriculture, which is still substantial because they now have a lot of money. Uh, the other thing is also in the Department of Defense. There is an emerging investment in defense research and development because we're facing a lot of, of, of problems. And the state universities and colleges, while they are also beneficiaries of grants of DOST and maybe DTI, they, they have their own money that can be allocated internally by the state university administration. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out that you might want to look at, and you've really mentioned it already, 
is the way they manage R&D. It is, in my experience, still a very infant, at a very infant stage. There is only, to my knowledge, only one institution in the whole University of the Philippine system that has a dedicated unit to manage R&D. The rest are really under the Vice Chancellor for Research, but there is no unit that will, number one, look at compliance in terms of research proposals, animal rights, human ethics, etc. cetera. Uh, budget, there is, so what we do, what we get at the DOST level is really a mixed, <laughs> mixed quality because it's not been vetted by the institution itself. And everything goes up to DOST to monitor and evaluate. <laughs> Whereas if the institution already endorses the proposal, we assume that the institution has looked at it very closely already. That system, and I'm afraid, is not in place. And that's probably why we're seeing some problems in log frame uh, construction, because the institution does not care whether it has a log frame or not. But in my, to my mind, before the university releases that project proposal, it should see to it that it has a log frame. Otherwise, <laughs> it should not be released and not, not, not endorsed, because that means the university does not exercise due diligence. I'm, it's not just UP, but many other state universities and even private universities. Uh, the, the private schools already can avail of grants from DOST under the Technology Transfer Act, provided they are considered as research and development institutes. Even private schools organized for profit can be given government grants. And the IP, the intellectual property, is waived. And the beneficiaries are the institutions themselves. And maybe DOST has already mentioned that to you. So my point is just, since you're, of course, bound by the terms of reference to look at DTI and DOST, there, is, there are other institutions that invest in R&D that may have an impact on the programs that are, you are looking at at DOS, especially at DOST, and also at DTI, because some of their MSMEs are based on uh, raw materials coming from agriculture, like ethnic foods, you know, or preserved uh, pr food processes, processes, processing industries. Their raw materials come from agriculture. We don't know where the, the connect is, and whether there is synchrony in the supply chain uh, to be able to <coughs> achieve efficiency. My last, my last comment is, how do you handle um, political will? <laughs> because many of your findings were already expressed as early as my time in DOST. It's not changed. And I don't know whether I'm correct in attributing it to political will. And my observation that, in fact, scientific progress is reversible. You fund a, an institute, reduce its maintenance and operating expense, it will deteriorate. And that's the, that's, the sensi that's the sensitive part. So I don't know how your, your experience is with other countries. You have a political leader that is proud about cheating, about uh, he doesn't want, his, you know, he doesn't want to be, he, 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 he doesn't like calculus, et cetera. So what, <laughs> what kind of, culture are you establishing? And in fact, if I might comment, many of our research uh, scholarship slots are not availed of anymore. We don't know what is happening to the younger generation, but they don't no longer have the ambition to pursue a doctoral degree. 
many of our doctoral degree slots are not availed of. Thank you, Dr. Padolina. Your response, sir? All right, I'll try to, to respond. <laughs> <laughs> so let me start by, so the last, the last question. So we, and I haven't showed the, the, the graph, but we have a graph in the innovation paradox about uh, commitment to innovation pays off. And I think this is an important issue because uh, <coughs> Uh, what we've seen in some countries is this swing in expenditure going to science, technology, and innovation, which is completely inconsistent with the fact that a lot of the outcomes from science, technology, and innovation are medium to long term. Yes? So despite that it's quite obvious to some of us, the reality is it's much more complex and we are getting cutting and all of that. So there are two things. One is you will never be able to um, completely isolate from political interference. What you have to try to do is to build the process as strong as possible to resist, as much as possible, okay? You still can have a politician that says, I don't wanna do more of this, but at least let's try to minimize the risk of that happening. And by having processes that kind of uh, try to minimize that. So the stuff that I was saying about the science technology parks, so let's try to have a process where the origin has to be clear, where you have different agencies and stakeholders that are discussing. Still, we'll not be able to isolate completely, but we can do much better in, times, in terms of uh, um, clear process about how to avoid this political interference, okay? And that includes the rationalization of instruments because we need good information in order to make decision not to remove the scholarships that are having an impact, maybe in the midterm or in the long term, but removing those instruments that are not having any impact. So I think we want to build again, and, and there is not a science that you can say, this yes, this no, but let's try to do it in a way that is more a structure, because otherwise the discussion becomes messy, it becomes political. I take from this, you take from there. No, not based on, on impact, and for that, you need all these processes, you need the monitor and evaluation, you need that the agencies are able to articulate, do not remove these instruments. We have an evaluation here that is telling us that that's having an impact. You know? So we'll never be able to completely isolate, but we can do a bit better in building these processes. So agencies and policies are more resilient to changes in government, and I think the graph is a pity, I don't have it in this presentation, where we saw political commitment and innovation, and innovation growth, and it's a, it's a line, you know, positive line, where you have Chile being more committed, they had better innovation results than other countries that have been swinging from a political party to another uh, and changing the expenditure, okay? The stuff on what we're missing. I think you're right, we've been confined to DTI and DST, I think especially the one on the, on the Department of Agriculture is, is missing, and that's, no, we don't have the complete picture of, of, uh, of, in, of innovation. For defense is something that we exclude because we never get, I mean, you ask, we tried in the past, give us um, the expenditure for uh, military R&D, no way. So it, it's almost become already, we don't even ask, because we tried, it's not only that we ask, the government asked, the people working on innovation, on planning ask, and they are not allowed to have that I information. Universities is a, is a different one, because in there it is true, and it's becoming, it's becoming more important, where you have some incubators, accelerators, and other instruments that are uh, supplied by the universities, okay? That's something that we, we've done in other countries, we've done a bit more of case studies, looking at the specific angles, but that needs to be considered as well. We don't have much, so on the R&D is one thing about uh, technology transfer units are in universities, the stuff on incubators and accelerators, for example, we have more of a mixed picture, where universities are not the best places to be located because they lack the entrepreneurial drive and the kind of the, the binding constraint of the private sector. So we see it as encourage your students to become more entrepreneurs, but don't expect huge impacts. The good incubators and accelerators are outside the universities, right? But I think in, in general, I'm a, I agree with you that 
universities are playing an important role and they have a very important role in some of, in some of these issues. And uh, when you get in that angle, then you have to go as well to see the, the list of incentives, the quality of the technology transfer offices, the intellectual property ownership, still a big issue here as well. Uh, and, and, and that needs to be done. And uh, that's something that as well as the second stage of our work, we want to work more on that part. And, and that may be uh, something that, that, that we can do. Okay. Uh, Dr. Justine. <laughs> Uh, Justine Seekant, BIDS, UP De Demand. I appreciate your highlighting the importance of origin, especially in the design of instruments. I think uh, your, your example of addressing market failures, particularly in the case of R&D in Brazil, and trying to address the, the externality problem of that, that's very important. Um, I'd like to know, because I'm also very interested in the analytical framework that uh, the approach you had earlier, um, has it been applied to other sectors? Because I can imagine that it could also be applied to, let's say, social protection policy and education policy. Are there any examples in, uh, has the World Bank done any work on this as well? Thank you. Dr. Sirera. So, I mean, I think, um, so I'm not that familiar with education and social protection to give you a, a proper response, but I think the, 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 the notion, the, b the very basic notion is the same. Solve, identify the right problem. Why don't these guys do this? You need to identify the, the, the right problem. It's as basic as that, okay? The notion of the market failure is more related to policies where there are markets involved, okay? Um, it's complex even to quantify, to quantify uh, the market failure or the type of market failure is extremely complex. The, s the things that we ask is more of a mapping of the problem, ideally the market failure. Why is it that the companies are not doing R&D, okay? So it's because this, this, and this. So then map it to the right instrument. And in many cases, you'll find different problems because uh, in the R&D problem that I mentioned, it, you have different types of firms. So uh, small firms don't do any R&D because they don't have the managerial capabilities and the skills to manage an R&D project. Of, of course, if you have a startup in a tech sector, a spin-off, they do. But uh, a an SME in a traditional sector, they won't have it. So then they don't, don't give them loans to do R&D projects. You need to focus on the capabilities to do R&D, okay? The finance problem is a finance problem. Try to sort it out. So in a way, what we're trying to say in more simple words is identify the right constraint. Because if, don't, if you don't get the right constraint, you won't have the right solution. I guess that's not so different from uh, social protection in education. Why is it uh, 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 students dropping from schools? But you need to find the right to, uh, to kind of design the right incentives to avoid that, okay? And one thing that I haven't mentioned very much, but is this idea of adaptability and, and, and trial and error, which is a different one, uh, it's a difficult one from a policy perspective, especially when you have the pressure on execution, is the idea that you may not get it right on the first place. But unless you evaluate, it's very hard to adapt because you need to, uh, when you do a pilot, for example, you need to measure, okay? So I'm not getting it right, we're not having the impact, we need to adjust. For that, you need some learning process and so on. Same for education, same for social protection. You try to do some incentives like that, but it's actually uh, going in a different direction. Uh, students are doing something different. This is not, and you need the process to be able to adapt. But the nature is the same. It's what's the, the, the real constraint? What's the problem? Why you're not achieving that objective? Okay. Uh, May we have, or may we hear from the gentleman in gentleman in blue to be followed by Dr. Uh, Albert. Hello. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, my name is Dan from Internet Society. So my question is um, similar to the person before. Um, will the report extend to other agencies such since this is a report on innovation and technology? I feel like it's important to mention investments in the internet or in 
information and communications technology. I feel like um, there's a department of ICT that is focused on public expenditure for, say, the free Wi-Fi program that aims to like make information and internet technologies available. So will the report also have a review on those um, types of investments? Yes, sir. And we're not focusing on infrastructure now. Uh, I mean, I think it's important to have the infrastructure. We're focusing more on the other side. I mean, uh, what are the skills to, to do internet, to do innovation using digital technologies? Okay. Dr. Albert? to be followed by the lady at the back. Uh, okay, so I won't introduce myself since I was already somewhat introduced. <laughs> um, the, one of the recommendations seems to be geared towards the idea that there's a need for more knowledge sharing and improving uh, processes and, and learning processes. Um, the only thing is, uh, I'm not too sure whether in your terms of reference this was specifically stated to identify I don't really want to use the term best practices, but I, you know, I, I just even an example of sorts of a good, good project where you have pretty much many of the things that you needed to have, even from documentation. But beyond that, because I, you know, when I teach at the AIM from time to time, and uh, I, I teach research processes, and I tell them, uh, you know, it's it's good for you to be able to see concretely. So what I do is I let my students see uh, executive summaries of past students' work, you know, and then that serves as a way for them to, to sort of uh, critique <laughs> what, 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 has, what, ha what seems to be working and what's not working because there's a tendency for us to, to, to sort of focus too much on what's good, but, but we actually also will learn even probably more from what's not so good, <laughs> so um, I, I, I realize it's 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 a, it may be I may be putting the World Bank on a, and, and yourself in a spot and to to sort of identify not so good projects uh, you know in documentation. But even if let's say you know you could use examples from other countries without naming the countries, but showing a project you know and and this was the documentation to to help people internalize why things are, are not good. <laughs> uh, because I think somehow that, that can help people and even managers uh, understand the importance of, of making a, a very complete, thorough uh, understanding of a project uh, you know, from the design to implementation to governance. Dr. Sera? So, um, so we have a, an issue, and this is something, a discussion that the, the, the team has had for a, for a long time, because we have an issue of conf confidentiality, uh, where we cannot say this program that we evaluated in Chile has this good uh, design implementation because this is and that. So it's very hard for us to do it because we would break this confidentiality issue. One thing that we have, um, we are doing, um, it's almost finished, we, we, we don't develop a, a guide for policymakers on innovation policy where uh, we go, and, and part of the motivation of that was this idea that we want uh, agencies to consider alternative instruments. And when we asked that, they said, okay, you tell us how. What are the other instruments available? We don't have the information. So we developed this guide that is gonna be, uh, hoping to finish now in June, launch in September, where uh, you, the idea is that policymakers can go to some of these instruments and to say, okay, what are the contextual factors? One thing, I mean, uh, that just to be clear, is we do not advocate for copying and paste or other instruments that have had an impact, no. But we still think that there are some good practices in the design and implementation. One is to look at the context for that implementation. So we are codifying all of that in a more generic way uh, in, in this guide, okay? The problem with these things, it's always good to put the good practice and not that so bad because I mean everybody wants to be have their own program uh, showing their uh, uh, you know um, this agency or this program was good and this is the reason why and uh, it's very hard to get uh, permission to say and actually this one is, is pretty rubbish uh, so yeah so there's always a bias and I agree with that on the good stuff not on the bad but these bad experiences we kind of codified as generic things about the contextual issues. So if you don't have this, 
don't do it. If you don't have science or R&D projects in university that can be commercialized or they don't have capabilities to provide R&D contracts to multinational companies, don't do a science and technology part. And uh, check, you know, checklist of these elements that you need to have in place. That's the way how we are approaching. Okay, Dr. Cicero will leave by 11 a.m. So we'd like to take the last question from the lady at the back. Uh, good morning, um, I'm Geneve Goyano from APEC Business Advisory Council. We are the voice of the Philippine private sector in APEC. Um, the a APEC Business Advisory Council is housed in Makati Business Club, which is composed of the 400 um, big business um, organiza business and companies in the country. Um, so uh, we've been actively engaging um, different government agencies to provide policy inputs on, say, um, MSMEs and digital innovation. And I guess, um, since it's mentioned in the presentation that you know, private sector and other stakeholders' involvement are critical in policy design. I guess some of the um, issues that we've encountered talking to um, different government agencies is for one, sometimes um, it's pretty challenging to find um, the some single point person to just, you know, um, start a conversation with and have a follow through. So that kind of presents like, okay, so how do we move forward, how do, we con how do we deepen the initial conversations we've started? And also, um, I guess it's safe to say that the private sector is keen on providing concrete support to policies and programs of the government, but sometimes we do not have um, information, for example, on, say, the impact of the ongoing programs, which makes us difficult, where are we, get where are we going to channel our supports? And for example, for sectoral data, which is very critical in policy, it depends sometimes on how organized an industry is, and that's where the information comes in. For like ITBPO, they're pretty organized, so they have like figures on like where they would need support. But other sectors don't have that. So I guess like moving forward, um, we can strengthen those aspects so we can have a more solid policy design um, yeah, in the future. That's it. Sir, would you like to? So not much to, to add to this, I think. Okay. Uh, I think uh, perhaps to, to qualify my statement, um, so the, the, I think you cannot do uh, private sector development policies without the private sector, but you also have to avoid capture, okay? So we need to, f there is a fine line. Uh, we need to stop doing one thing, but we need to avoid capture by large in industries or, or, or organizations, okay? So you need to, and I think the way of doing that is to, again, and I know I'm being very heavy on this, but on processes, having a clear process, which is not only what paper and tick the boxes, but you know we want to improve R and D. Okay, uh, focus groups, discussions. Okay, and then a design. The design has to be done from the government. Okay, and then you need to think about implementation. In some cases, for example, in early stage, uh, the public sector shouldn't be implementing some of these instruments. It's for the private sector, and it's about how to create good intermediaries, having good contracts of uh, performance, performance contracts where people are, are accountable, but they should be more privately. So they have to be a private sector. It's critical and it's involved, but avoiding capture. Okay, so that concludes our activity this morning, and we would like to thank you, Dr. Sirera, for sharing with us your comprehensive presentation, and of course, to the active uh, participation of our uh, uh, audience, but uh, before that, may I uh, request our audience to please fill up the evaluation forms given to you earlier and leave them at the secretariat. See you in our uh, future activities. Thank you so much.